hello everybody. My name is Lutz Jaretner. I'm from Germany. I entered the field by 2006. I want to thank you for the invitation to speak here. Um, I came interested, I became interested in the puzzle of Lena and I wanted to solve it, but it took me a long time. So my, my goal was I wanted to have an explanation that remediates LENA, L-E-N-R, with the um, established principles of, of physics. And that turned out to be a hard um, journey. But I believe I achieved something that fits into that picture. So the puzzle, as it was um, apparent to me, consisted of some input uh, elements that went into a, re a reaction and produced results which seemed to be at odds with um, established principles of physics. So, as was said already here, um, there was an observation of helium which could come from alpha particles. There are some protons emitted, not many. Um, there, there is an output of stable elements instead of radioactive, uh, radioactive isotopes. So especially the absence of tritium was, was one puzzle piece that didn't fit well. There is heat output and there is X-ray output, but no gamma. Very few neutrons were detected. The cathodes sometimes showed very interesting craters that could not be so easily explained. And lately, there is an um, increasing number of observations of strange radiation. I will dive into this. I will explain what it is or what we, what we see in the experiment. And this was also something that didn't fit in the uh, traditional picture. And on top of that, there are some radio frequency emissions. There are some very interesting magnetic effects. So all this contributes to a puzzle that I wanted to solve. And I looked at the current explanations that exist in the community, and I was asking myself, could it be the lattice? Is it plausible that the lattice is conducting this reaction? And I was analyzing massive amounts of documents that already were produced by the experimentalists, and I didn't find a very strong evidence that the reaction really occurs in the lattice, because then the reaction products would, show, would have to show up in the lattice. I couldn't find much of an evidence either that the uh, increase of the surface of the material will proportionally um, increase the reaction rates. So I tried to put something else in there as, a, as the intermediate state or the nuclear active environment of, of uh, Lena. And I named it condensed plasmoids, which is the title of this presentation. So my approach is I want to compute uh, with quantum mechanics a um, intermediate state with a much higher electron density than in normal matter to explain the reaction. So let's speak about strange radiation. I believe that strange radiation is the same as condensed plasmoids. So what you see in some of the experiments is exactly this intermediate state. The um, strange radiation or condensed plasmoids have been seen many, many times and were named in many different names by experimentalists such as Winston Bostick, he called them uh, vortex filaments and, or character filaments. Ken Shoulders had observed them and named them EVs or EVOs. Then there was Takaki Matsumoto, he named that ring clusters or something like that. And um, there was observations from Savatimova and Rodinov there was observations from Woodscuff, I think he named that um, strange radiation. So that's, that's where I got the name from it. And then there were more recent photographs from Claude Davio and um, co-workers. 
There are other terms in use, let's say microball lightnings and, and so forth. So it has been seen over a very long time and nobody could explain what it is. So let's look how they appear in experiments. What, what can be seen there? One of the first uh, photos in the LENR um, research was from Mozier Boss and co-workers at Spayroar. And they appear to be little craters that look like molten palladium in otherwise um, not molten surface. And they were called micro explosions because the assumption was that, that, that some very high thermal energy caused this, this melting. I do not believe it's melting. I do not believe the effect is thermal. But what you see is a crater. Now, other experimentalists have seen other craters. For example, Ken Shoulders, with very little energy, was able to create little objects that hit surfaces and created uh, craters, which, again, looked like molten. Then there were electrolysis experiments in the fleischmann pons times uh, type uh, electrolysis. They produced a sort of crater that was not molten, but uh, interesting enough and compares to what the other pictures show. Um, there are other forms of these objects, so they do not always look the same. So Ken Shoulders saw, saw this uh, ring structure in one of his, his targets, which made him very curious about the, the nature of these objects. Matsumoto saw these ring clusters, made very many of them, in electrolysis experiments. Then there was a, a photograph on X-ray film, I believe, from Claude Avio, which is a very clear picture, very nice ring. There was a similar photo, also on X-ray film, from Rodinov and Savatimova. So this is another example of what can happen. And strange enough, in some cases, we see periodic or quasi-periodic -peri structures of very different um, flavors, many types of them. And in my model, which I'm going to explain, there is a basic structure, a self-organized structure of these objects, which can be used, if you deform them slightly, which can be used to explain these complicated patterns. So this is one indication that the explanation I have and the experiment, uh, the, the uh, microscopic images in these experiments show the same thing. Now let's, let's explain what the basic idea of my theory is, because I believe this is easy to understand and everybody can kind of think about it. Um, this, excuse me, what was that? Um, this uh, equation shows the strength of the magnetic field at the surface of a wire where a current flows through. So nothing special, usual textbook formula. The interesting thing is that the radius of the wire is in the denominator, which means there is a singularity if that radius approaches zero. Now let's think through what that means. It means if you have a wire, and let's, let, no, let's assume the wire is not a piece of metal, let's assume this is a plasma, right? A, a current, currently, current carrying plasma is a plasmoid, so it's a plasma wire or a plasmoid that is having this radius. Let's assume that. Now, if the magnetic field increases, what will happen? It will create a pressure on this plasma, it's a pinch effect, a set pinch, mm -hmm. and the wire will become thinner. Now, this formula says if the wire becomes thinner, then also the magnetic field becomes stronger, and this is kind of a positive feedback. Once you have a critical value of current over magnetic field strength, then this goes 
so to speak, forever, it will collapse the matter in something very dense. And the interesting question is, how dense will that become? How, where does it stop? So there are two answers to that. The first answer is the compression that takes, takes place in the Z-fringe will normally increase the temperature to a degree that you have thermal pressure, and the thermal pressure will create some instabilities or, or will hinder the further collapse of the matter. However, there is also radiation coming out of electromagnetic ra radiation, which cools the plasma. And if that is a very thin plasma wire, the cooling is very effective. So let's assume the temperature is low and will not um, produce the back pressure. Then what will, what will happen? What will stop the, uh, the collapse? And the answer is, it's the degeneration degeneracy pressure of the electron gas. It's a quantum mechanical effect. You can't compress uh, electrons in an infinitely small um, volume because it would increase the inc uh, um, kinetic energy. So this is what I wanted to calculate. The quantum limit of the, of the um, compression that takes place in a that pitch. Now this is the result of a plausibility check. I wanted to assure that my calculation results were in sync with basic formulas known in, in physics. So I was using a um, formula that's popular in astrophysics to compute the degeneration, degeneracy pressure in white bars which hinders the collapse towards a, a neutron star. So that curve is, is this one. I co computed the uh, magnetic pressure from my simulation results, and they were not far apart. So it, it roughly looks like I did a reasonable job somehow to, to compute the right pressures and forces in there. Now, astonishingly, the pressure that comes out here is 2 times 10 to the 21 Pascal. This is five orders of magnitude higher than the pressure in the solar core. So we're talking about something very exotic here. And this is just the set pinch collapsing to something else <coughs> for the quantum limit. Um, the results you see here in these curves were obtained at a radius value of 35 picometers and a, a current, intrinsic current in that wire of 9.2 kiloamps. Let's ask the question, which physics applies to these objects? We have a choice between plasma physics to describe that because it's a plasma or a plasma. We have a quantum mechanic, which may be good because we are collapsing towards the quantum limit. Let's see what it says. If we have plasma physics at low temperatures and high densities, what does it give? Plasma physics will, would predict that the plasma dissolves into atoms and molecules. Well, um, that makes no sense. At these densities, there cannot be uh, atoms anymore because they are much too close to each other. The electrons become delocalized, so you won't see atoms. And also, the current does not stop. This whole thing is still conductive, even at low temperature. So I would think that plasma physics is not aligned with the observed lifetime, lifetimes of, of these objects. The plasmoids do not decay into regular atoms and molecules as far as the experimental results show. So what I thought that I need quantum mechanics. And to be honest, I hate quantum mechanics, but I have to use it, right? And the quantum mechanics predict that the um, condensed plasmas remain in the uh, plasma state because of delocalization of the electrons. And uh, only this aligns it with the observed lifetimes of condensed plasmas, which go up above hours and so in some cases even days, what, what has been seen in the experiment. Um, 
The next slide shows the basic assumptions I'm putting into my quantum mechanical modeling because I wanted to know the properties, so I had to do some computation, and for the computation I need a model. So the model does very few assumption, uh, assumptions. It, um, it assumes that we have a long channel, a plasma wire, with densely packed uh, nuclei. It assumes that the distance between the nuclei are so small that all electrons um, are delocalized along this channel. And uh, the electrons are supposed to move relatively to the nuclei so that I get a current through that plasma wire. So this is all. This is the whole set of assumptions. Nothing, nothing else, no, no rocket science. I'm using something that is hopefully well established in the textbooks. It's the Hamiltonian um, with uh, so-called so minimal coupling. It describes the total energy of an electron in a magnetic potential and an electric potential. So it, it, should, be, it should be familiar and it should be agreeable. The formula is a relativistic one because I assume the, or I will get out velocities of the electron which can be up to 80% of the speed of light and I thought it's more precise to do a relativistic Hamiltonian. Um, if you quant quantize this uh, Hamiltonian into a uh, quantum mechanical <coughs> equation, you can come up with the Plan-Gordon <coughs> equation um, if you ignore the electron spins. It's kind of the, 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 the direct way to quant quantize the Hamiltonian. So I did this, and I was using cylindrical coordinates because I have a long plasma wire. It has a cylindrical symmetry in it. Then I needed to compute the electric potential and the magnetic potential from the wave functions and the um, nucle nucleic charges. So this is the formula that, that was put in for that purpose. And then I had to solve this uh, Klein-Gordon equation. And in order to do so, I first of all made this um, product ansatz. So I wanted to separate the wave function into something that is going in actual direction, in uh, azimuthal direction and in radial direction. And the actual wave function solution is known, so that I can write that down, it's, it's done. The azimuthal <coughs> wave function is also known, it's done. Only the radial wave function looks a little bit com more complicated. It's the solution of this component of the Klein-Gordon equation which I have to solve. And unfortunately, there is no analytical solution available in the literature for that differential equation. So what I did was, I was replacing, or I was doing a, an, an ansatz where the wave function was approximated. This is the, the, the uh, radial wave function here. It was approximated by a polynomial <laughs> multiplied by a uh, decaying, radially decaying exponential function. And also the potentials in my equation was um, approximated by a polynomial. So if I put that in to my um, differential equation, I can find an analytical solution. If I use these coefficients for the um, polynomial here, I have an analytical solution, which is nice because it speeds up the uh, computation time. Um, I, I need to say something else here. I need to say that, just a second. With this equation here, it is assuming that I can, with reasonable precision, use a single electron wave function computed from the mean potential of all, all the other electrons at the nuclei. So this is an ex approximation again. 
it is not the full quantum mechanical solution that we would, would normally do, but I have billions of electrons. I need to be uh, um, more simple in my approach. So what comes out of that sim simulation? So I wrote a program. I simulated uh, thousands of, of orbitals. Each of the orbitals represent groups of large groups of electrons. And the summary of, of that, what comes out, the parameters that I computed is, I found no upper limit of these objects. They can grow infinitely large. I found something that is somewhat a minimum length. So these objects seem to have a minimum length in the order of 10 micrometers. <coughs> it's not precise. It's a, a guess, so to speak. I see in the um, electron distribution, I have a radius of these plasma wires, which go in the range of 35 to 130 kilometers. And it's a range because the condensed plasma can exist in many different uh, configurations. The matter density in these objects can be up to 100,000 times denser than ordinary matter. So this is very significantly different from what people tried in the lattice, right? much higher density matter. There is an intrinsic current flowing in these objects. The current cannot stop. If the current stops, the force goes away that compresses the, the channel, and the whole thing explodes. There are reasons why these currents continue to, to flow once they have been started through external conditions. The mean velocity of the electrons is between 16 and 40 percent of the speed of light. And the uh, potential inside the core of these objects goes between minus 7 and minus 60 kilovolts. The reason for that is there is an excess of negative charge in there. So there is, let's say, up to 2 percent more electrons in these objects than nucleic charges, which makes them attractive for the ions. The ions are safely trapped in there, but the electrons are not. They could fly out, and only the magnetic field holds them towards the, towards the core. Of course, I wanted to know also the binding energy, and that, that came out as a disappointment. The binding energy is between 10 and 120 kilo electrons <laughs> per electron. So this is an endothermic binding energy. It, it, from an energetic perspective, it's an unbound <laughs> electron. But it's not unbound in the sense that it will fly away. It's unbound in the sense that if you stop the movement of the electrons, it will then fly away. So I believe that this is a preliminary result. I believe that I, I have some, some terms missing in my Hamiltonian, which will later, in later time, find a correction. I can't tell you now. I don't know. Let's look at the electron density distribution. So um, <coughs> you see these curves here. This one is the electron density, and the, the other one is the uh, current density. We have 0.2 electrons per uh, cubic picometer, which is extremely high electron density. We have current densities of up to 2.8 amps per square picometer. This is astronomical high uh, densities. From that, we can compute, or I could compute, the uh, electric field, which goes up to plus minus 700 volts per picometer. We have magnetic fields, which go up to 50 megatesla. This, is, this compares to the magnetic field in the pulsar. Right, astronomical object fiber. So it's something that we cannot achieve in the laboratory on a microscopic <coughs> scale. But microscopically, microscopically, the fields are that high. So once you, once you accept this result from the simulation, then you can ask the question, what does it enable? How does it relate to the LENR 
experiments. And a key thing to translate that to experimental findings is the minimum distance between the nuclei that comes out of the calculation. And it's two picometers with hydrogen, four with oxygen, and eight with gadolinium, for example. This is small enough, I believe, to enable a tunneling to the Coulomb barrier. And the Coulomb barrier is also very much shielded by the high electron density. So we have much more likelihood for a Coulomb tunnel. And it also works with other elements. So here, with gadolinium, which is a relatively large um, atom, you see this is still so close, it can tunnel. So we, we, we would expect tunneling not only with hydrogen, but with, with all sorts of elements. Um, also, this is really cute cold fusion. The, uh, the elements do not need to have kinetic energy to do the fusion, because it's purely tunneling. And the nice thing is they, they stay uh, next to each other for a very long time, so there is enough time. <coughs> okay. um, when that tunneling happens, some of the uh, energy of the excited um, elements can cause spallation. So if we n do not reduce ourselves to just fusion, but assume also the uh, p potential output channel, we can see fusion fission as an option. So this is just a hypothesis, but I think it explains why elements like helium, like, like calcium, like iron, will be produced with something like deuterium and palladium, for example. So you wouldn't expect that from a simple fusion process, right? I came up with yet another hypothesis <coughs> that the high electron density is also um, helping to carry away the nuclear excitation energy. So if the nuclei are excited and vibrate or oscillate in the, um, with their electric and magnetic dipoles, the high electron density and the high current density could absorb that energy and trans uh, convert it down to small changes of the electron velocities. So it's, it's a process of down conversion. I have to hurry up a little bit for, because the time we goes We should by. keep that for questions because you are going to get dozens of questions. Yeah, <laughs> sure. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. So yet another um, uh, assumption is, or hypothesis is, that the high electron density is able to enhance um, beta plus decay or would uh, enhance electron capture in favor of beta plus decay, which would explain why we don't see the annihilation radiation coming out of positron, uh, positrons. <coughs> so um, what we see in experiments is that these objects stay for a long time I think there is a nuclear feedback into the um, kinetic energy of the electrons. So I believe that the um, cooling of the uh, uh, nuclei by the electrons lead to an uh, increase in the velocity, in the average velocity of the electron, which would, would explain that these objects can, can grow and can uh, produce electricity to the outside electrons. This is one of the most interesting uh, speculations in, in there. I would say, be careful with these objects. I have seen many experiments in the past where people did not even know that strange radiation exists. I believe these objects are dangerous to the human body. It is known that they can produce intense X-ray and ultraviolet light. This is not a speculation. This is a known fact. Um, observers, experimentalists, have seen them passing through thick walls of linear apparatuses. So they come out of your apparatus unexpectedly. 
They can destroy electronic components easily. They can ionize all matter, which often looks like melting. You have seen that in the craters that I was showing you. And I would advise, and this is really, I mean, I, I hope you stay healthy for, for your entire life. And I think it requires proper shielding of your apparatuses. I would recommend thick walls of iron before we know a better solution to that. I have one more slide because a warning, a warning is not a good end of a presentation. This slide shows an apparatus from Anatoly Klimov. Thank you, Anatoly, for this excellent experiment. I will not explain the details of that. I will only focus on the cathode here, which has a very wide shining here. And when we speak to all. Yes. And the cathodes afterwards show these cratering in their surfaces. So the comment that I want to make is, you can see um, condensed plasmoids with your naked eyes if they have a high density. Uh, Anatoly calls them erosive metal clusters. It doesn't matter, it's just another name for the same thing. And I tell you, once you see them glowing in this way, and once you see the craters here, you do no longer need um, um, to have calorimetry to find out whether you have excess heat. You will have excess heat in the kilowatt range. So the real, the real challenge now is build an expert apparatus like Anatoly did, which shows this glowing. And we are almost done. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I guess we have so many questions that I propose that people who do want to discuss that with you uh, don't drink cafe, keep here in the room between during the coffee break, you know, because there are probably so many questions. I even uh, nurtured one myself because, you know, the instability you show in plasma, it reminds me that in the 15s uh, already, uh, the physicist working on hot fusion made a zeta pinch uh, experiment, you know, and they discovered the first uh, instability in plasma, the sausage type instability, exactly for the reason you mentioned. But at that time, they were making hot fusion, and, and they did see neutrons. The plasma focus devices, they saw filamentary structures which are mm -hmm. identical to condensed plasma, so they also saw cold, cold fusion, you're right. Yes, but in that case, you get neutrons. We don't see neutrons. So, uh, a question. I understand the generation of these things, or more or less, in a plasma focus experiment, a similar experiment. But what does that have to do with, let's say, outgassing from palladium cathodes? How do you account for the generation of these things in an experiment that seems to have a very low energy density? Where is the currents coming? And what, how can you think about that? I do have a, a reinterpretation of the fleischmann pons experiment. Please come to my uh, poster paper, and I will explain in detail how that works. I can't say it in one sentence, sorry. I stay here and be it's absolutely fantastic that this um, um, science gets an airing at uh, this conference. So thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, a couple of experiences. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Keep that for the coffee break. Eh? Hmm? Keep that questions for the coffee break. I, it, it's, it's more about warning and experience. And I think if everyone wants to have the benefit from that, just a few people learning would be nearly pointless. I'll give you one minute. Okay, uh, so um, first, uh, strange radiation can be misinterpreted three body interactions. And just like uh, spots and worms uh, are, can sometimes be um, misconstrued as nuance, uh, we need to be able to separate that. Now, Bogdanovich has done a lot of work uh, and showed that condensed plasmoids can survive for two days. Um, and uh, so these are real things, and they can also form crystal clusters that, that can then go over a surface and cause uh, similar tracks. Um, so you need to look at systems 
like, for instance, in a webcam or what I saw with the echo fuel where the plasmoids absolutely shredded plastic that wasn't moving at all over a number of days. Um, uh, Sab Atomova saw these things, I think, and other researchers have seen their um, then a material change elements over a period of time. And I think, uh, you know, that's because of these structures. <coughs>